Hi everyone, it's Belinda Gaskell here. We're just going to give ourselves a few more minutes for people to join the line. And so I'll just go back on mute and we'll be back with you shortly. Okay, I can see there's still a few more people joining, but we'll, we'll get started. So hi everyone, I'm Belinda Gaskell. I'm the Director of Professional Development for IABC Asia Pacific. Um, it's really great to have you join us today for today's wedi we webinar on setting up a crisis ready communications team. So before we jump into today's discussion, I've got just a couple of quick things I wanted to mention. Um, firstly, good luck to everyone in the region who submitted Gold Quill Awards entries. Those awards will be announced at the annual IABC World Conference in Vancouver in June. So there's still plenty of time to book your spot at that event. Just head to wc.iabc.com for details. Um, also, just a th second thing, thank you to all of, um, all of you who shared feedback on our webinar program. We, we are listening to that feedback and, and hope we, you like what we have in store for the rest of this year. Um, in fact, the most requested topic we had from the survey was crisis communication. So I'm really pleased to introduce you now to today's speaker, um, jean Viev Hilton. So I was really fortunate to hear jean Viev speak late last year about her experience managing crises across geographies and cultures. So it's great that she can join us here today. As you may have seen from the bio, jean Viev is Head of External Comms and Corporate Citizenship for BASF Asia Pacific. So jean Viev has worked in corporate affairs and sustainability in Asia Pacific since 1994, primarily in Vietnam and Hong Kong where she's based today. So in her current role, she's got quite a broad remit, stakeholder engagement, corporate citizenship, sustainability, crisis, 
media, corporate publications and channels across 18 markets. And she's also a fellow IABC um, Vice President for Professional Development um, for the Hong Kong chapter. She's also a, um, an IABC Excellence Award recipient for her contribution to the profession. So we thank her again today. Today, John Viev is going to share her insights on how BASF develops a crisis ready organisation in a very diverse region uh, across a lot of business units and a whole wide range of markets. So I'll hand to Genevieve now to speak. During the webinar, everyone will be in mute mode. So you can ask questions via the question button and Genevieve will answer those at the end. So I'll hand over to you, Genevieve. Thanks very much. And uh, looking forward to doing some sharing today. Uh, I hope that the uh, technology works today. If it doesn't, then uh, I'm sure Belinda will let me know. So to take a little bit through where we are going to, uh, where we're going to go through today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about BSF and, and crises in general, and then about crisis management because uh, there's no, no communications without management. And then finally about crisis communications. But before I do that, uh, since we're in a webinar format, I thought uh, it might be useful to know where I'm coming from. Um, so I dug up some photos, and because you can't see my face on the, um, as we do, to, do in a live event, you'll see on the left, that's actually from my very first crisis communications training session when I was, a, I think I was about um, 14 or 15 years old. I was a member of my um, township emergency management team. I operated the radios. And uh, so uh, funny enough, you know, how many years later I'm back in the world of crisis crisis communications, but there was a lot of uh, wandering around the world in the meantime. Um, I moved to Asia to Vietnam in 1994 and uh, uh, have some experience as a travel writer, as a singer, as a nightclub manager, and a few other things. And one of the areas that I've been particularly interested in um, over the last decade is in trying to get uh, the Trans the um, transformation between crises and digital and well external communications in general, but especially crisis. And so you see me there in 2008 um, trying to promote sun protection ingredients by showing the how short my shadow was on July on June 21st, uh, the shortest day of the year. So I've been at BSF for about a decade now, and uh, what you'll hear today is a lot of um, explanations for all the mistakes I made and what I've learned from them. Learned from them. So maybe you can learn from them as well and not have to go through some of the things I did. So one of the first things I had to understand when I joined the company about a decade ago is what I was dealing with. It's, it's a big multinational. It's a more than 150 years old. And, uh, it's, and the products, the chemicals, are used in almost every industry. So uh, in other words, our crises can come from anywhere. So a catalyst um, which removes pollution from a car, uh, you know, a, um, a, a bee pheromone which um, helps organic farmers to uh, avoid pests, um, you know, anything, uh, you know, a piece of um, polyurethane insulation which keeps the refrigerator cold. So not only are the range of uh, locations diverse, but also the range of topics. And because we've got a pretty good record uh, over the year, um, it paradoxically makes it more interesting when something bad does happen. So because we've uh, had a very good um, environment, health and safety record, uh, it means that um, when that doesn't work out, um, suddenly it's global news. And uh, of course, with 115,000 people around the world, uh, more than 300 production sites, um, a crisis can come from anywhere. Here in uh, so-called my territory is Asia Pacific. So I'm based here in Hong Kong, and we are looking after, um, at the moment, 18 markets. Um, we just opened a Cambodia office, so we call it 19 markets now, all the way from uh, Japan down to New Zealand and as far west as Pakistan. And uh, that's about 18,000 employees, 100 production sites, also quite a wide range of cultures. So if you think about the difference, the cultural difference between Pakistan, you know, New Zealand, Japan, um, that's equaled also in the level of resources we have. In some of our smaller markets like Philippines, we have one communications person who's doing everything from posting the internal posters on the wall at the plant to handling strategy to handling you know, just about any any communications topic you, you can think of, you know, marketing, uh, 
um, holding customer seminars and everything. In China, on the other hand, which is our biggest market in Asia, we have a huge team, so huge communications team. So the, the difference um, there and the challenge is actually one much more of coordination rather than lack of resources. So uh, one of the things that um, people always ask whenever I do intro training, which is a little bit of a funny question, what is a crisis? And um, so our, our flip answer to that is whenever the BSF Asia Pacific president declares it a crisis, then it's a crisis. And the corollary, of course, is if, if, if uh, he doesn't say it's a crisis, then it's not a crisis. But uh, in general, it's something that um, I like to call it. It's somewhere when the impact is high and the speed is high at the same time. Uh, and one of the challenges is to prevent, is to use communications, um, best practices to, to prevent those long burning, slow burning issues from becoming crises and prevent those smaller level incidents from becoming crises. I mean, unnecessarily, as it were. I mean, not that there's anything such as a necessary crisis, but uh, that's, that's another question. Now for us, um, we also have to understand what characterizes crises in our particular organization. So when you're setting up your own crisis readiness, um, your situation might be different from any other organization. Um, if it's an NGO, it's different from a multinational chemical company. If it's a, if it's a commercial business, it's a service business. In our particular case, what we're looking at is we have a lot of off-site and remote locations. Um, we, have major, we have a major production site in Xinjiang in Western China which uh, can only be accessed by a small military airport. Um, in quite a lot of the big countries, um, sorry, the big, big production sites, India and China, we have uh, our joint venture partners. Uh, the government is always very interested in what happens in the chemical industry. That varies tremendously depending what kind of industry you're in. Um, I think resource limitations is something that is common to almost everyone. And in particular, during a crisis, the resources that were enough to handle routine work are not enough to handle a crisis. So that's something I'll mention later. Um, so for example, if you have a small country, someone who's always doing the translations by herself or doing the media monitoring by herself, that doesn't work when it's the middle of a crisis. We also have a giant matrix organization. So we have um, 11 business units operating in now 19 countries. And we have to figure out when does the business unit take charge, when does the country take charge, and that is much more of a management issue. But it's, it's different from when there's, say, a single line of business. And the type of business will often dictate how the crisis is managed. We are also a highly culturally diverse organization. I don't think I ever saw it uh, so, so starkly uh, demonstrated as during the Japan earthquake, the so-called 311 Great East Japan earthquake. Um, when we had uh, people from Germany who were very paranoid about radiation because they all grew up around the time of Chernobyl versus uh, people from, not versus, but they were trying to work with the people from uh, Japan who were very focused on um, ensuring that the, uh, the group was cohesive and that, the, uh, that there was not, um, nobody was creating a panic. And uh, meanwhile, very, very oddly, I discovered a, a fascinating thing that we had um, two Mexican guys named Alex, both based in Japan, who didn't know each other. And uh, you, I don't think I ever would have uh, found that in another company. By the way, that's a picture from a real crisis in China. And you'll see there's a, um, an Australian, a Chinese, a Korean, a German, and a Swiss guy in the, <laughs> in the, in the picture. And that's just a, a, a random snapshot. So looking at where we really need to um, start our preparation is also understanding what are the potential incidents. And when I, I'm going to use the word incident here because these are the ones that were not, yes, it's not really a crisis yet, but could have been. Um, some of them might seem laughable except for the fact that people really cared about it. Um, so it's not really a big deal, you can say, if one dog has died. But if that dog is the... Um, is in a place where animals are very valued and people really care about them as their children, um, then uh, it's a very different um, experience from whether it's a stray dog in India. And that's a huge cultural impact on the, um, on the incident. So handling it carefully according to the 
um, according to the country, is a big part of preparation and or understanding the the range of potential incidents. Um, we also have uh, have a kind of pre um, preconception among our management that a crisis at a chemical company is always going to be a chemical crisis. So they think of um, fire or leak or something like that. But actually, some of them are natural disasters um, or say things that are beyond our control. One of them might be epidemic disease. I've been through SARS, swine flu, bird flu, and a, I think a couple others at this point. Oh, and uh, these are these are something. It's very much like treating a natural disaster. Um, but when your company is highly networked and highly dependent, um, you have to think about what are the, you know, what are the reactions which would prepare you to develop a. In other words, what are the reactions that, that you would take which would not make it worse, but would rather um, control the damage? We also have, generally speaking, um, natural disasters. Uh, one of our production sites in Malaysia is in such a location that half the year they have floods and the other half the year they have drought. Um, our Bangkok office is very accustomed to dealing with floods by now. And our production site, I found this fun fact, our production site um, outside of Bangkok has the largest fleet of boats in all BASF, in the entire BASF world. Later on, I'll, uh, if you want to, you can ask me about some stories. I'll tell you more. So part of this understanding of crisis is also what would turn a small incident or an issue into a crisis. And uh, generally speaking, um, there are ways of dealing with small incidents at a level which is appropriate for what we think is a big incident. And then there's a level which is appropriate for what the rest of the world thinks is big, or when there's a lot of wrong or information, or sometimes it's a societal issue, which is big, and we think it's small because it's, for us it's small, but for society it's a big issue. There's quite a lot of um, fear overcoming unknown, uh, fear of the unknown overcoming facts. That's particularly true in the chemical industry when Chemical is kind of a bad word. People think, oh, chemicals are bad and, and um, dangerous and uh, think each and every chemical is equally toxic and deadly, whereas um, in some cases, yeah, chemicals are toxic and deadly in certain amounts and others are not in certain other amounts. So, but when we talk to our stakeholders externally, they always think it's, um, it's terrible and deadly unless they know otherwise. And they don't know otherwise unless we provide the information and are very transparent. So uh, what the example I like to use is the um, is the illegal potato from Sweden. So nobody uh, nobody was injured in the planting of this potato. Um, no plants were or animals were harmed in the in the planting of this potato. However, because it was a genetically modified potato, which was uh, designed for industrial use, you take this potato and you make starch out of it, um, and it was planted in the wrong field. Uh, this potato was on the headlines of the um, European news for every day for an entire week and became the biggest incident of uh, 2010. Um, and why was it? It's not because of the physical harm, it's because uh, of the greater societal issue involved. And most importantly, it was because my colleague from the business unit who planted the potato in the wrong place didn't think it was big, a big deal, so he didn't tell communications team about it. So uh, it was so-called discovered by an NGO, and uh, it became a big deal. Now, I'll take some examples from the other companies as well, because uh, I think they illustrate it better than our own company would do. But some of the things that will go wrong in a crisis, um, one of them is reacting too slowly. Uh, some of you have heard about the Dolce & Gabbana uh, issue that happened in um, in my part of the world uh, recently, but the one the picture I'm showing you above is actually from a few years ago. Uh, this was a one of my favorite cases to look at because the incident, which was a kind of nasty security guard who prevented people from taking photos in front of the shop, and very strangely prevented only Hong Kong people from taking photos, but not mainland China people from taking photos. Uh, this had been brewing for about a week and a half. Um, it was on these. It was on social media. It was on discussion boards. It showed up in mainstream media, and 
it became, I'd say, the most fascinating talk of the town. Um, it was obviously a huge political issue. This was the protest that showed up um, after a few days. And it was six days after this protest that Dolce & Gabbana finally came out with their first statement. And that statement was, it is regrettable that D&G has been involved in this incident. Uh, unsigned, by the way. So that was definitely a case of reacting too slowly. Um, and I, I wish I'd been inside D&G to know what they were thinking at the time. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you look on the upper right, the example from Samsung is an interesting one because they did not uh, react slowly, but they did appear to deny that there was a problem. Um, so this was after photos had been shown of the, uh, which would seem to demonstrate that there was a problem with their, their device. But uh, rather than addressing or engaging, they appeared to deny that there was a problem. In the lower left, uh, you'll see the famous um, Malaysian Airlines MH370 case. Uh, this was, has always comes up in the discussions of crisis management. And uh, my personal take on this was never that, you know, it's, it's not the first time an airplane has crashed in the world. Uh, this happens in, in the era of modern aviation. But um, I have always taken my own analysis that what went wrong there was more that they treated it mainly as a Malaysia crisis. Um, and therefore, they didn't include the um, stake, they did not address the stakeholders who were from China, who were the passengers and the families of the passengers on the plane. So you see that's a protest in China about an incident which happened, well, which, whose origin is in Malaysia. So this, uh, beyond anything else, uh, one of the quotes we've seen from, a, I think it was an Australian professor actually said, that uh, they're handling a global issue as if it were domestic politics. Now, just to show that we're not alone, um, you'll see on the lower right-hand side, this is a BSF production site. And that was, I think, about six years ago. There was a, about two kilograms of um, nitric oxide released, uh, sorry, nitric acid released. Uh, it was all cleaned up within, I think, about 15, 20 minutes. And some, uh, there was definitely some um, emissions to air at the time, but uh, not anything more dangerous than, um, say, my, my friend after he eats a big, a big bean and Frank's dinner. Um, and say nothing, more, nothing particularly more toxic than that. But here's the, here was the issue. It took, um, it took about 52 minutes from the time of the incident to convince the management that this was a visible incident which needed to be disclosed externally and proactively. So we posted our first post on Weibo 52 minutes after the incident. The issue, of course, was that by that time, um, I think 29 minutes after the incident, there had, sorry, 22 minutes after the incident, someone had taken a picture, um, posted it on Weibo himself, and that had been shared 29,000 times by the time we got around to posting our um, first statement. Now that happened six years ago. Um, we wouldn't get so much time now. Uh, in November of 2016, we had a major incident in um, our production site in our home, uh, their global headquarters in Germany. And that, uh, after that incident happened, the first tweet was posted one minute afterwards. And the first aerial footage by some guy who happened to be flying his airplane on that day was posted within the first half hour. Uh, you cannot be fast enough uh, nowadays. So there's no, there's no time for decisions. Oh, maybe, maybe nobody will see it. Maybe they will ignore it. Um, maybe it's not dangerous. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, the management structure has to come first. Um, I was lucky enough that when I joined BASF about a little more than 10 years ago, around the same time, we had uh, our head of corporate security in the region appointed as the head of crisis management in the region. And um, what he did, and I think very well, is to set out a crisis management structure um, to provide the organizational structure, reporting lines, what are the roles and responsibilities, and in particular, this is a generic structure. I mean, you, you remember all those different types of incidents I mentioned at the beginning? You cannot possibly have a crisis plan for every different kind of, you know, 3,000 incidents that might happen in the world. So it has to be generic. And 
once this management structure is in place, how are decisions made, then we can start to think about communication structure. One of the important things that I, um, and this might seem silly, but one of the most important things is the internal management notification. Um, because once there is a way of conducting information from management to management, uh, which is defined as the responsibility of the management, suddenly you get much less pressure as a communications person to be responsible for taking notes and um, acting as a secretary in the middle of the crisis when you've got 14 or 50 journalists to deal with. So uh, this, this system, we have two things. One is called the Rapid Incident Report. Um, and this is an online system which has a backup as facts. Um, and this is basic information that the local environment health and safety person has to fill in. And it automatically goes to the um, head of environment health and safety Asia, it goes to me, and it goes to our global fire, deport, fire department in Germany, who obviously they're a fire department, so they have 24 seven coverage. So if something happens in the middle of the night, they get that message and then they call me at home or they call the right person um, at home until they get someone. Uh, likewise, from management to management, we have these situation reports, the country to the regional, the regional to the board. And these are the ones, not the statement for external use, but the, um, the summary with all the gory details and uh, how we're making our, you know, the minutes of the meetings, that sort of thing. But this Crucially, again, is not the, not the responsibility of the communications department. That's the responsibility of the management team. Um, I've been trying to get our lawyers to take responsibility for this. And in some of the countries where we have the in-house in lawyer, it works very well. They take the best notes, by the way. And then finally, from a management point of view, again, sort of, it might seem silly, but administrative support. Um, every second, every minute you can save um, during a sudden crisis, uh, will make a difference in how well the communications works and obviously how well the management works. So where's the meeting room? Can you kick people out of it? Um, what if your own building is on fire? Where do you go? Here in Hong Kong, we have a local, um, we have a local office. So it's our regional headquarters office. But we have had the experience where uh, there's maybe not going to be any access to the office. One of them was the Occupy Central protests that happened several years ago. And after that, we said, okay, we need a place to go. So luckily we have one small concrete admixtures laboratory out in a totally other part of the part of town. So I've gone to visit there and, um, and checked out the place and make sure the Wi-Fi works, um, make sure they have maps. One of the most wonderful things I like to see in a, in a crisis meeting room is maps. They're really useful. And also we set out the rules for how are people supposed to talk to each other? Can we have, can we run the whole crisis over WhatsApp? Um, where, which lines are encrypted? All of these things um, are, if you talk about it in advance with the management team, it's much better than trying to settle it when the crisis is already live. Oh, by the way, that picture is the Thailand management team um, talking about the flood, the flooding in Thailand uh, when they had to evacuate um, several production sites. So they're at an off-site uh, location. Now, here was my starting point. When I, again, when I joined um, about a decade ago, here was a starting point. Uh, this was the Asia Pacific Crisis Manual, Crisis Communications Manual, or part, a few pages from it, as it existed in, 20, in 2006. And one of the most important things that I was grappling with while I was trying to update it was that every there we had to define what do you do before a crisis and what do you do during a crisis and these these things were both included in the existing manual which was very good but i thought to myself when the crisis is happening it doesn't help me at all to open up the manual and say oh here's all the things you should have already done good luck honey so instead i wanted to separate them and so I updated this to three parts. Um, so this is what our manual looks like now. So the first part in red is a little bit like in case of fire breaks glass. You, you take that manual and you see very simple instructions what to do and with a, little, with a couple of help, helpful hints. Um, that's really short. Uh, and it is essentially a manual which you can use any time, even if you already know the content, because you're under stress during a crisis, but you pull it out and it helps you remember. 
The second part is the working documents, and that's different for every production site, every country. So it's things like, you know, um, local language information, it's um, telephone numbers, uh, it's checklists for particular locations, and, you know, passwords to uh, update the website, that kind of thing. The working documents are also something you'd use during the crisis, but the third part, the preparation manual, which I want to focus on more, is all the things you have to do to make sure that number one and number two work. So let's talk about that preparation part. And the first and most important is, of course, that we know who is responsible. Um, it is surprising how often I've found myself in situations where something is happening and no, is, no one is in charge. And is it the communications person is supposed to be running the show? Um, and it helps a lot when the communications person understands that his or her role in the crisis, that there's an alternate for that communications person, and they understand at the moment the crisis strikes, they can then ask their management, shall we form the country incident management team? Which sort of prompts them to, to get the management um, running. And in fact, one of the crises that, or yeah, the, one of the incidents or crises that I was involved in that didn't work very well was in um, Korea when we unfortunately had a contractor who was exposed to uh, uh, phosgene gas and, um, un and unfortunately after about a week passed away from the, um, from the exposure. Now, part of the issue there was that the management team, the crisis incident, sorry, the country incident management team had not been officially or had not been formally um, started up on, a, on the occasion of the incident. Um, so there was a little bit of, you know, people wandering around saying, what shall I do? So that was the, uh, that was a little bit of a problem. Since then, we have been much more diligent about ensuring even the communicators know when to prompt their management to form the, the, uh, the team. Now, when there isn't a communicator available, for example, we opened an office in Myanmar um, in the past two years and even a production site, but we don't have a full-time communications person. So instead, um, before, the, before any crisis strikes, we um, signed a contract with a local PR agency um, setting, out all of the, um, setting out the hourly rate, setting out how are we going to communicate, that kind of thing. And then it means just at a moment's notice, we can activate it when we need to. One of the important things as well is to establish issue monitoring so that you can, by the way, that is not our monitoring service. That's just what I, I wish we could have um, in, the, in the picture. But one of the things we have to make sure is, um, do we know when a crisis is coming? And uh, sometimes we have been very fortunate that because we've got decent issue monitoring of um, news, social, and internal sources, um, we have been able to see an issue kind of bubbling up before it really gets to be big. And that's the way we can prevent the issue from, from becoming a crisis. Now, the way we, d we handle this actually is we have each and every country gets their own um, media monitoring service because we have not found a single service that really does all the countries equally well and doesn't charge the moon and the sky to do it. So if anybody knows this magical magical agency which can really do that, let me know. But I will remain skeptical until I until I see that agency. We also conduct um, risk assessments in advance. Um, I do this sometimes with the regional business unit. For example, I might go and work with our agriculture unit and see what kind of risks or what kind of particular ideas uh, they might have which would be a problem. So, for example, with our agriculture unit, um, one of the interesting things that characterizes that unit is that they have quite a lot of marketers out in the field, in this case, literally in the field, like with the farmers, um, who are not very well connected to, uh, let's say, the BSF corporate world. So they're quite independent and they are not well monitored. So that was, a, that was a risk we identified with the agriculture unit and then tried to figure out ways to bring them a little bit closer to, to the company so that they would maintain BSF policies and standards. On the other hand, um, another unit, it's very different. It does not have people out in the field. It has some very um, specialized products, very specialized chemicals, which are created in very large um, 
scale production sites which have uh, which deal with a lot of dangerous goods and, ha and hazmat. So in those cases, um, for example, one of the ways we managed to look at the mitigating factor or the prevention factor for that kind of risk is by establishing community advisory panels around the production site, which I'll talk to talk about in a minute. Um, if there are particular uh, issues that are the top risks, I do advise um, coming up with a position or a standby statement. Often I find that uh, there is already a statement somewhere in the world. It's just a matter of knowing where it is. In our case, we have on our global intranet for communications a thing called the, the basics about. So if you want to know what is the BSF sort of official position on uh, plastics in the environment, on genetically modified um, organisms, on um, uh, endocrine disruptors, on you know any just about any topic, then we have that in the in the library. We can't cover everything, but it covers quite a lot, and it's already very helpful. Uh, we also um, do do quite a lot of work to pre-assign resources. So sometimes you might think, okay, every communications person has a media list, right? Isn't that um, isn't that easy? Isn't that obvious? But one of the things we found during um, a drill about two years ago is that uh, one of, I think it was Malaysia, they have a beautiful media list which is on their corporate network, which they found out that they cannot access at night when they're out of the office. So they're trying like hell to put their, you know, get the computer connected to the company network and then get the VPN started up and then, and then, and then. So where does that media list live? Uh, at the same time, it's quite worthwhile at the site level to have external services like medical services or embassy. That's, that's for the site, for the production site to, to handle. That's not for the communications department to handle. But just make sure those lists exist. Um, in our case, uh, non-governmental organizations and activists are handled by the comm team. But maybe it's different in your organization, but what's important is to find out who is responsible for them and that they're keeping in touch so that when the crisis happens, they don't have to go digging around and Googling and trying to find you know, who they should inform. At the site level, we have um, what's called a, every site has to have an office alarm plan. Now that is gonna be different in each and every location. I think in Singapore, they use an external um, service to send text messages. In uh, some of our sites in, uh, in China, they use a subscription level WeChat group um, funny enough, in uh, Hong Kong, we found that everybody reads their corporate email um, obsessively, so we decided to use email. But having said that, I also found um, last year during the Super Typhoon Mankut, when we activated this, that um, it was quite useful to have our internal statement um, posted externally on BSF.com, the Hong Kong view which meant that even if someone was out of the office and we needed to tell them like, okay, don't come to work today, um, then they could still see bsf.com. And here's what was really interesting after that. I shared it on the corporate Facebook and I shared it on the corporate, um, I shared it by email. And then the next day after, um, after the typhoon was over, I did a little survey to see, did you find out about the news? And I think it was about, you know, 30 people I surveyed, just a little bit of a dipstick, and about half of them got the email. Um, another of, the, of those left, the other, uh, about half of them saw it on Facebook, and the rest of them saw it on LinkedIn, which was interesting because I hadn't posted it on LinkedIn. So uh, apparently one of the employees had posted it on LinkedIn, the others saw it that way. And one person didn't get the message and came to work anyway, which I thought was a decent record. Um, but the point there was that the statement we used um, was able to be used in any situation and the network worked, even if it didn't work perfectly. We had the plan and we had, we had uh, practiced it in advance. One of the other things that I think is highly useful um, in, uh, it is in advance to get an approved translator who's, you have his telephone number, you know, 24 seven how to reach him or her and uh, make sure that you can, uh, you can do this translation at the last minute. Again, even in a country where usually the calm person does the translation, if it's the middle of the night and you know, your calm person is trying to handle everything, she can't 
she doesn't have time for translation. So uh, the other half of that is depending how your website is, uh, website works. Can you update your website? It looks pretty bad if you're in the middle of a crisis and your website says, um, you know, act now to get our latest um, discount, or even worse if it has some content which is really related to the crisis. So how fast can you update that website? Can you do it remotely? Um, if you don't handle it yourself through a content management system, then who does and how fast can they act? Um, in, our, in our case, uh, I remember one time when we had to uh, very suddenly update our China website, we found out that, um, let's see, the first person who, was able, who had to update our China website suddenly, this wasn't a real crisis, this was just um, some wrong information posted by our, um, our joint venture partner. Uh, but the, the first person who had to update our website, um, we found that she couldn't do it when she was outside the office because her VPN wasn't working because it was China. Uh, the second person was um, also in China, same problem. The third person was the regional head of online communications who happened to be on an airplane at that moment. The fourth person was me, and I had just been issued with a new smart card, meaning that my uh, technology wasn't working that day. So the fifth person was the global backup, and he did it. But uh, it's worthwhile having backups and backups to backups and alternates to backups. We also want to make sure that all our corporate materials are pre-approved. Um, in our case, uh, I remember a few years ago when we had um, a Greenpeace uh, investigation into our production site in Shanghai. Uh, they were accusing us of um, dumping chloroform into the river, which was interesting because we did not produce any chloroform at that site. Turned out to be the next door neighbor. But they um, wanted to know, the media wanted to know how many people work at our production site. And it took me two days to figure that out. And uh, that was a message to me that we needed to have this corporate information ready in advance. Two days to figure it out was because there were two different legal entities and they couldn't agree on what they should describe, how they should describe their unit. And, you know, it's a simple thing, getting stuff approved, uh, but it can take time. And since everything is so fast, two days was too late. So for that reason, we have a complete set of country backgrounders and site backgrounders which we update once a year, um, which is what I'm doing right now, by the way, because our annual results are coming in a few days. And uh, those are rigorously checked once a year, and then they're ready to go. Uh, likewise, for all of the dangerous goods that are used at a particular, particular site, or um, if they're chemicals used in bulk, we get uh, each site has their chemical database with the pre-approved wording. So you can describe the chemical, and you can also describe what the risks of that chemical are. And most importantly, it's already translated into the local language. So again, if that chemical has had a leak, it's too late to try to find out from someone, how do you translate you know, butyl glycol into um, Urdu, or into uh, Tagalog, or into Japanese. You have to do that in advance. We do a at our site level and our country HQs, uh, we do quite um, a lot of work to ensure that we have a designated press conference area. So we just imagine what will happen if protesters show up at our office, if media show up at our office or at our production sites, where will they go? Uh, generally speaking, for a pro during a protest, what you don't want is to block them or send them away or security guards to get in a fight because that makes the incident even more exciting for the media. So instead, we have a designated area for protesters and a designated area in each production site. Before anybody gets angry at you and when things are calm, that's the time to establish communities. Um, you know, the, you don't want the first time the journalist here hears from you is in the middle of a crisis. It's much better when you know that guy first and you've been um, talking to him all year long. Same with government contacts. Um, find out what the notification procedures are. Uh, employee associations, labor unions, um, are there informal ways to, to notify employees uh, about an incident rather than waiting for them to get the email officially or uh, receive the information from the media? We also set up um, community advisory panels, as I mentioned earlier. So you can see in the upper left picture, that's our 
head of BSF China shaking hands with the head of the community advisory panel in Chongqing. And um, in the lower left, that's a production site open day, which we hold a few times a year, where the, uh, we invite members of the community to come and see, what's, see what happens at the production site. Um, I know it's probably not quite as exciting for the children as going to visit the cookie factory, but um, we try to make it fun. So we hold something called Kids Lab, um, where they get to do chemical experiments, safe chemical experiments um, for children. And uh, hopefully that gets them excited about chemistry as well. Um, likewise, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I established our very first um, social media accounts back in 2008 is because I saw this would be a very convenient way to, um, to communicate during a crisis because if when the crisis strikes, it's too late to start building up Facebook fans. You have to have them already there. And same thing with your newsletter subscribers. It's too late to start building up a subscription list if the crisis has already happened. Now here's something quite important, is that all these things I said are a lot of work. So we, as a result, we have to do a scheduled audit um, on each country about once every one or two years. Um, so this is done by the region audits the country and the country audits the site. And we see what have you, you know, have you done all these things? Do you have an office alarm plan? Do you have a media list? Do you have um, your chemicals translated into local language? And then the most important thing is practicing because you always find out the gaps when you uh, practice. And I'd much rather find out the gaps during the rehearsal as, during, as opposed to during the live one. So in the lower right picture, you can see that's a, um, a drill, which um, that was actually a fun one from my point of view as the organizer of the drill. We had, um, we organized a very realistic scenario where there was an a big employee meeting and the ceiling collapsed. Um, and this didn't really happen. This was, uh, this was just for the drill. And uh, it was totally unexpected for the management team because they thought we were going to give them a chemical incident to manage. Up on the upper right, you see this is a thing I do once every few months, is I send out um, a bad scenario to all the communications people in, the, in Asia Pacific um, with no advance notice, and it's called surprise statement, and all they have to do is write a statement. And then I post them on my internal blog after that, and we all comment on each other's statements, um, anonymously, of course. Uh, and then the one in the middle you can see is a case where I used um, an ordinary topic, but we treated it like a crisis. So the topic was the Green Building Week, which is not particularly important. It's just a, um, just a say, a very ordinary topic. But we suddenly announced it at 8 o'clock p.m. on a Tuesday, Hong Kong time, and I tested how long does it take to get a news release, an internal message, a website message, a social media message in all of the languages of Asia Pacific um, from the get-go, if everybody's acting as urgently as possible. And apparently the result is still, it's about, I can't get it faster than about two hours. So I have to take that into account. It takes, it takes just the mechanics of sending out a message take a long time. And of course, one of the ways to, um, to get, uh, to get in practice is to deliver presentations to industry groups like IABC about your own crisis communications procedures because that will remind you of some of the things that you really should have done lately. Like for example, I noticed my surprise statement, I haven't done one in about six months, so I should really get to work and do another one soon. Now I'm gonna pause for a moment and ask our moderator um, whether we, should, we have time to go into the what about during the crisis or whether we wanna start Q&A now. Um, why don't we start, um, hopefully you can hear me okay, why don't we start with a little bit and then people can start to get their questions ready, start to pop them into the Q&A box on the screen and then once there's a couple there you can maybe pause and answer a few, does that sound okay? Sounds fine um, and I don't, see, um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box yet but maybe that's because I haven't, post, haven't opened it. So I'll continue now but please start posting your questions. So because this is about readiness, I haven't spent so much time about on during. Nevertheless, I'll mention a few things. Uh, one of them is that we try to establish principles for communication. And one of the most important was that supporting public safety uh, comes before minimizing damage to BSS and the brand. So if there's ever a conflict, for example, if we have a leak or something, um, or an emissions to water or air, 
and telling people would damage our brand, we still tell people. And what that means in, real, in practical terms is that I ask for the first announcement to be ready within one hour of the incident. I would like it to be one minute, but I know it's not practically possible. And they ask, when should it be proactive? And it's whenever you can see it, smell it, or hear it. We've had incidents where um, in one of our production sites, there was an ammonia cloud that came out of one factory. And it couldn't see it, and you couldn't hear it, but boy, you could smell it. And people got very worried if they didn't, people would have got very worried if they didn't um, know what it was. And in that first hour, uh, remember that the communications is done by the comm team, whereas the management notification is done by the management. The country level is allowed to approve that first statement. And that's something very unusual for us. We're usually we have to get all kinds of approvals. But in this particular case, I just um, grit my teeth and I say, please get it right the first time and make it simple. And it can be approved at the country level. Um, they decide as well whether it's proactive or reactive, and each one of the stakeholders is assigned. They all use the same, the same statement, the same wording, and then within that first hour, they disseminate it all at once, so simultaneously. That's the first, first hour, is getting that first statement out as fast as humanly possible. And then during the first day, it's, um, then you go into things like working on the Q&A. Maybe you need a potential press conference. You need to get your executives ready. And you follow up on the secondary stakeholder groups, uh, NGOs, academics, people like that. And you look at your advertising and marketing. Um, for example, do you need to place an ad or do you have a campaign running right now which is gonna look very silly while you're in the middle of a crisis, you better cancel it. During the first week and beyond, um, one of the most important things is always reassess the situation. Maybe this isn't a big deal anymore or maybe it's a bigger deal than you originally thought. You keep on getting regular debriefs. You also have to think that maybe you thought the crisis was over. Maybe it's not, maybe it's coming back. You know, the NGO is coming with a lawsuit. Maybe there's new findings. Maybe the government comes to action. So that means during the quiet times, um, you focus on strategy, building up content. Maybe seek third party endorsement, build a microsite on, the, on your website and talk to your opposition. After the crisis is over, conduct that review and act on it. So. Uh, once the crisis has happened, um, I find a lot of people forget pretty quickly. So I'll, for example, I'll set an alarm for next quarter saying, hey, did you do the things you said you were gonna do? Um, Microsoft Outlook is very good at setting alarms for me. Likewise, um, when the crisis is over, that's the moment to ask for budget for preparing for the next one because the management will, um, will forget just as fast as uh, anybody else does. And uh, they will always be much more willing to uh, to fund your crisis preparation when it's fresh in their mind. So that's it from, uh, from my side. I think we can go to Q&A now. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, signboards about being prepared and uh, easy communication. Um, also, by the way, culturally appropriate for that market, which is not Hong Kong. So I think now we can go to Q&A. So just a reminder, everyone, hopefully you can see the Q&A box on your screen or the button. Just um, jump in there and, and type something in. And while well, we've got um, the benefit of John Zier's experience, it'd be great to answer any questions you have. This was certainly um, a really popular topic, so I'm sure there are questions there. So at the moment, uh, I do not see... Um, I do not see questions in the Q&A box, is that? Uh... No, I'm not seeing anything in you there yet either. People are a little bit shy at the moment. Um, and John, have you mentioned a few stories? If there's any other stories, maybe you could share um, something else okay. with us while we wait and see if anyone uh, pops something through. Then maybe I'll go back to this page. Um, Linda, you can, uh, you can choose. Which story do you want to hear? Okay, sorry, no, but there's a, there's a question that's come in. Can you see that okay, jean Yep, yeah, here we are. And I think that I'll stop sharing because otherwise everyone will see all the questions. So I'll look at the, I'll look at the Q&A box, but stop sharing my screen. Um, 
Okay, so uh, taking a look at the um, first question, which was uh, during a crisis, uh, at times during the crisis, comes from Korea, the media or public demand an official apology, which has more to do with the global brand's attitude towards a certain local market. However, sometimes brands are reluctant to issue any statements that imply anything that admits to a fault, especially for legal reasons. There's no fixed answer, but what's the best way to work out a solution? So uh, this, is, this is something that comes up from time to time. Some locations actually do have a legal uh, answer for this. Um, I think Hong Kong is one of them. Um, I know that India specifically does not have one. Um, that there can be, there are certain laws in certain jurisdictions which are the, like the apology law that says if you apologize, it doesn't mean you're admitting fault. Um, so the most important thing is showing empathy. Uh, when a... Um, when a person who has been affected by a crisis himself or imagines himself to be affected by a crisis thinks that you don't treat him as a person, then um, you know it's really not uh, it's it's really not going to help if you formally apologize using formal wording if you haven't said um, you know we're devastated by this uh, and our hearts go out to the victims and we will do everything we can to make it right, this kind of, um, this kind of wording. Um, having said that, all of that, there's almost, I would say, I have almost never heard a real case, a legal case, which has been won or lost on the basis of whether someone said they apologized. So uh, the, the empathy comes first, but I'd say the actual wording of the apology is not quite as important. Um, okay, one of the questions, uh, looks like we have a very lawyer-based um, uh, once what, we have someone asking how do we interact with lawyers during the crisis and do they vet all the statements? So in our case, um, we have uh, actually at the country level, all, most of our countries have lawyers um, and they're part of the, the incident management team. So they are more and less powerful depending on the needs of that market. Um, so for example, if you, you compare with American uh, companies, they are in a situation where they might be sued at the drop of a hat any day. It's, it's not easy. Um, we are an EU headquartered company, so we tend to do, do it a little bit more distributed. We basically give the country control. Uh, let's see. Um, that also, I think, answers the other question, how do we get past a very micromanaging executive team that won't let go of approving everything as it happens? Um, so we actually do have our executive team in the country to um, be able to look at the statement and approve it um, when it goes out. But uh, they, are, they are told that that's their responsibility and their right. It does not mean that it has to go up to the president level and the global level and the business unit level. Um, and we have to conduct um, training sessions for our management pretty frequently. I mean, I did two in the past three weeks for our regional management. Uh, reminding and reminding them of this fact that the country is running the show. Uh, we have a um, we have a question. Do you have any suggestions for short desktop exercises with impact that we can run to test our team? Uh, it depends whether you're testing the management um, interaction or whether you're, depend whether you're depending the you're asking the communications people. So it's really what do you want to test them on? If you want to test their ability to write a decent statement, then you can do a surprise statement exercise, do it all by email, like I did. If you want to test, um, you know, how much they, uh, you know, how, how well they interact with the management, then you need the management in the room. And, and for example, you do it on a country basis or for the country management team. Uh, coming up with the idea is actually what I think is quite fun. Um, you know, it's an exercise in creative writing. And uh, the creative writing can be just think of the worst possible thing that can happen and then make it as realistic as possible. I often take things that have already happened and I make them worse. We have one question, which is what is the role of the agency during a crisis? And um, this, is a, this is really depends how your company works with agencies. We have um, agency in are small countries who work very, very closely with the team and can be like on site with our, you know, with our country communicators during that moment and are really treated as members of the team. Um, 
And in other cases, for example, they might be in the same room with the management and giving advisory to the management, um, helping to write the statement, that kind of thing. In other countries, we have a very strong in-house team, and we mostly work with agencies on a project basis. So we, won't, we don't work the agencies as closely. But I don't think there's any problem in bringing the agency in during a crisis, um, especially if they already know your business well and you work together frequently. If, on the other hand, your country is not well um, prepared for a crisis, it's just you don't do it very often or you haven't been training, um, it's worthwhile getting to know an agency which um, might be able to help you during a crisis and even if you don't sign a, you know, a regular retainer contract, just to get familiar with them and say, hey, you're the guys we're going to call if anything happens. Now, uh, John, uh, Dave, it's Belinda here. I think um, we might need to wrap it up there because we're actually about to hit um, our time. But uh, it's been great to kind of get through. You know, you've raced through as many questions as you possibly could there. Thank you, everyone, for submitting those. Um, I just wanted to make a, a few sort of final remarks and um, you know, first I obviously want to thank you jean Vive, on behalf of everyone who joined today to, for sharing your insights. I think you've just got so much experience and we're all the beneficiaries of that today. As, as I did mention at the start, this presentation was recorded and we'll make that available to everyone who registered and as always we would love feedback so, and, and also suggestions on future topics. So we'll send all that information out. Um, after the event. And I just want to also mention our next webinar will be with Subhamoy Das from India, who's going to be speaking to us about the power of AI in communications and what we can all do to stay ahead of the game. So um, just thank you again for your time. We'll close it. Thank you again, jean -Vive. I'm sorry to wrap it up in um, a bit of a hurry. We don't want to be cut off here. Can I, can I answer the questions um, in, in typing and will the attendees have access to that later? Um, that I'm not sure. Perhaps we can answer those offline in, in the response when we send out the post-event um, survey. Is, is that okay. possible, jean -Vier? We can work with you on and including those answers. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I just want to make sure we capture the answers, uh, capture the questions so we can, yep. I can follow up. Brilliant. Yes, we can absolutely do that. So we'll capture all the questions. Apologies to anyone who didn't have their um, questions answered in that quick rapid fire at the end there, but we do appreciate the questions. We do appreciate your time, jean -Viev. Um We'll get those answers and materials out to everyone as, as soon as we can. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>